So here we are again in longer tables, and you already know every everything there is to know about my very good friend Martha Stewart. Welcome to the show, Martha. Welcome. Thank you. So nice to be with you. So let's go directly into business. Big Martha, your mom. Uh, she was known for being a great cook. And so we want to know the stories of, of, of the people, the stories that they are not known, that they are not obvious. But very big way of who you are today, I have a very big sense that is because the way you grew up. How was like growing up with Big Martha around this amazing cook? Well, Big Martha was the mother of six children. She had six children over a period of 21 years. So she was uh, very maternal, very kind, and very uh, lovely mother. I mean, not one of her children would say anything other than mom was the best. Uh, she cooked all the meals. She made sure that we were beautifully clothed. She sewed our clothes. She... Um, she is also a teacher. So when the youngest child, Laura, went back to went to kindergarten, mother went right back to teaching sixth grade. Uh, she took a little bit of a hiatus off while she was having those all those kids, but um, but she was just incredible. And she the food she cooked was out of the garden. My dad was uh, a pharmaceutical salesman, so dad was dealing with Pfizer, selling the drugs to doctors, visiting doctors all day long. And I remember when um, a, a dairy that was in our town, a cow dairy for milk, um, burned. All the cows were suffering from burns. That was in New Jersey. No, it was in, in Nutley, New Jersey, not far from New York, right? Uh, right, uh, like like 15 minutes on Route 3 to New York City. And there was this big cerami dairy. And I remember my mother and father going to visit the cows, sort of like you visiting the disasters of, <laughs> of humans. They went and, and medicated the cows and uh, then took us all over there to see the suffering cows, which remains with me till this day because it was a pretty horrible sight. But that we were taking care of them was the important thing, that we were, we were facing disaster and taking care of them. That's what my parents did. My parents were really very civic-minded. Dad was the scoutmaster, so he would he did the Eagle Scouts, so he would sit on the stage with the big American Indian headdress on made out of feathers and, and chant all the, all the Eagle Scout um, uh, pledges uh, to his audience of Eagle Scouts. And uh, that was the, that's the highest Boy Scout that you can be as an Eagle Scout. Yep. So did Big Martha, you, your dad, uh, entertain a lot at home? How you well, became the, the queen uh, of entertainment? I mean, well, the, were you helping your we, mom in the kitchen? We, you, you definitely, your... definitely. Mom, I was second to, I was little Martha. So I was first daughter uh, of six children, second child. And, uh, of course, I was, I was the apprentice. I was the apprentice, and I was constantly cooking in the kitchen next to mom. We so, have people coming into this amazing place oh. we are. Oh, with wine. Uh, oh, my gosh. Wine. What kind of wine did you get us? Me, yeah, I'd be able, because we are in a very, very, very beautiful room. What is the place of this room? This, because I'm here because you. This was the newsstand. The newsstand at the Rockefeller Center. Center. Yes, oh here. Let's God, move this, this away this so place. that you can get this so, back. Yeah, my people are going to be so happy that they use. Thank you for opening me the wine, people. Oh, my God. I made, oh, my God. This is Castillo y Guy Rioja, Grand Reserva 2010. Oh, my God. Yeah, I have no more budget. So this is a Spanish wine that we are going to drink. Well, it's just funny that you asked about Big Martha because just yesterday I assumed the role of Big Martha in our family. And I had uh, a niece, uh, the daughter of my sister, Laura, and a nephew, the daughter or the son of my sister, Kathy, uh, come to my house. And we filmed... Both of them learning how to make potato pierogi from me because I had learned at my mother's knee. So I taught them how to make the dough and how to make the filling and how to form the dumplings, how to cook them, make the brown butter and serve them. So that we did that just yesterday. Isn't that nice? Unbelievable. And so, they are delicious. Those so pierogi pierogies. was one thing that reminds you of, of, of where you began. But what other dishes you remember 
that they, your mom will make that you will say, oh my God, nothing like what Big Martha. Nobody used to else cook. can make it like that. Oh, like stuffed cabbage. Stuffed cabbage. We call them golumpki. Golumpki. Yeah, so you might have had them in Ukraine. All those dishes are very. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're delicious. Eastern Europe. And she, well, she, her parents all came from uh, Lwów in, in uh, Poland. And they came over when they were children uh, and settled. Her parents settled in Buffalo, New York. La Buffo will be La Beef. Yes. La Beef, well, La Beef, yeah, Poland, but La Beef, yes. but, but La Beef uh, in Ukraine. Yes, exactly. Leopolis, we call it in Spanish. Uh -huh. Oh, my God. And so then, your, your ancestors will be Ukrainian Polish. Ukrainian Polish and Greek from the island of Kos. Way, way back. I mean, it's a long time ago. My father's last name was Kostyra, Kostyra. And they all emanated from, well, emigrated, I guess, emigrated from coasts to Poland. And they were farmers also. And so they grew up in uh, Krakow. And Krakow is like a, like a breadbasket of uh, Poland. Yep. The most beautiful, beautiful farmland there and, and gorgeous, uh, gorgeous food. Um, my mother also made something that you would love. She made a, a jellied pig's feet. A, uh, and it's called stujolina. It's stujolina. Yes. And that's, you would boil the pig's feet and you had to have knuckles too because the knuckles had more gelatin. And so you boil that until the meat falls off the bone. You boil it with white onions and then you um, serve that and garlic and then you take all the meat off the bones and chop it all up with the skin. The skin is important. And you then strain all the liquid and you make a beautiful mold of jellied pig's feet, and you eat it with white vinegar and fresh grated horseradish. It's See, amazing to have you memories. You would like that. It's amazing to have, going forward, memories back when we have the first thoughts about what we used to eat with our family. It, to me, is one of the most amazing moments. When I remember dishes, my mom, my dad, my, my aunt, my grandmother would cook for me. In certain moments that I feel down, those smells, those flavors, but more, more important, those moments in the kitchen, if you were there or in the table, it kind of makes you, makes you find who you are again. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's what I did yesterday because my nephew, Morgan, he was this very brilliant young man, handsome, tall, you know, brilliant young man, father of three little girls. He wanted to know exactly how to make pierogi. And he... At my mother's funeral, he gave a eulogy of describing my mother making pierogi for his family. And he said it was a hot day, and the kitchen got very hot, and my mother just took her blouse off and kept her apron on with a brassiere. And this is what he described. And she just continued unabashedly making pierogi in his kitchen. And, uh, and we all laughed at the funeral, you know, because that, that's exactly what my mother would have done. But um, and, and not thought a thing about it. She just she just was hot. She just said she was too hot. She had to do that. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. But mom was um, not only a really, really great cook. She knew ingredients very nicely, too. She really cared about the ingredients. But our food was homegrown for the most part, simple, delicious, healthy. None of us have cavities in our teeth. You know, we all have clear skin. We all, you know, hopefully will live a good long time. I love to see how your eyes are illuminated, just telling me. I, I, I think you have photos in your brain right now on all those moments. And I love not only yeah. your smile describing to me this moment, but but how how she beautifully shiny your eyes are of oh, brightness. Nice. Thank you. Well, this it, is fascinating. So it was it was a, a, a simple beginning to a complicated life. Complicated because my life is complicated. I do a lot of different things. Well, you had your first uh, entertaining in yes. 1982. Yes. Your first my book. first book, which is 40 years old this year. Can you imagine? You're 44? You're 48? Uh, I 46? wish. I wish. Well, uh, but 40 years, and I didn't write it until I was 41 years old. Unbelievable. So, so I'm, uh, getting, I'm getting older, but I think I'm getting better. And I think that, and I'm on my 100th book right now, 100. 
How many books have you written? You have a lot. I've no, written. no, they have only four. Oh, four? I got, I I got, nobody two. can catch up with you. I but wrote like two, a, I brought two you, of your books. You're, you're like a modern uh, um, Irma Rombauer, the oh. Yoyo of Cooking. That well, I, that's she a, did that's that a compliment. Book. Later that, in her life, and look at what she's become. Obviously, nobody doubts it. I mean, come on, you, you, you really are the person that created the first food media empire well, in more ways than one. Thank obviously, you. so what we want to know is those stories of being a businesswoman in uh, early eighties. You you had that book, but obviously you had dreams. How, how was it like being Martha Stewart in the early 80s? Well, in 1982, I, ri I write this first book. And, of course, my publisher, uh, at first he wanted it to be in black and white with all these beautiful pictures. And uh, he said, you know, we haven't done an all-color cookbook before. Colored photo. I said, they, the colored photographs are so beautiful. I had Michael Scott do the pictures. He was a really well-known photographer at the time. And I said, that has to be in the story. They didn't trust me to write the story, so they wanted me to get someone to help me. And I had not found my voice yet. I mean, I was 41 years old. I had been a stockbroker. I had been a model before that. And I, hadn't, I didn't know I could really write. So I got Betsy Weinstock, Betsy Hawes Weinstock. She was a writer for the New York, uh, Ma New Yorker magazine and uh, a beautiful writer. And so she helped me find my voice, my, my writing well, voice. Well, you were a mother when you were 13th. Yes, I was. So, yes, you were. But that's a, a model. Woman, that's not always... a voice. Okay. Okay, uh, that's a look. Uh, okay. I agree even things I, have changed. I was obviously. a look. And now then, we could argue that models, they all have a very big voice yes. in more ways than one. <laughs> yeah. Things have been changing, and in a right. very big way, they've been changing because but, a woman like you has shown the way, I would say not only to women, but also to men like me. Oh, yes, and, and my fastest growing audience right now is men, which is so nice because uh, I think that they also appreciate what I, I have taught people. And... And because I was a child of two teachers, both my parents were teachers. My father was a teacher as well as my mother. And they taught us to really respect our teachers and to learn something new every day, which is still one of my mottos, and to be bold and to be resilient. The more you know, the more you know you know nothing. Well, that's Do you right. have that feeling? Well, no, I think the more because you, you know. Because you say you want to keep learning yes, and everything. The, yes. But it's not that the realization that sometimes you know so much that you are very aware when well, you there's so learn many other... about something like, oh, hold on, where this came from? Yes, but I don't think that I don't know anything. I think I could know a whole lot more. And that's and when you stop thinking that way, then you're not no longer a student. And to be a good teacher, you have to be a good student. So one of the first time I was honored to be invited. Cheers, by the way. Hey. We're drinking. We're drinking this beautiful Rio Castillo y Gai, 2010. I think oh. got hundred points. This mm, one. 100. I mean, we have we have in front of these new Moral. Stand, <laughs> studios. If they let me, I'm gonna do every podcast of mine right here. We have a great mm. winery, a great wine shop right there. But I want to go back to. Oh, it's that good. This is amazing mm. wine. I want to go back then um, to. I remember being invited uh, by you, by your team. I was cooking with you. In this amazing set, in this amazing, pristine, beautiful, studio. shiny kitchen that happens was in a studio, but could be in the most amazing, beautiful house. And I was cooking with you, and I remember this is the way I am that I was very much cooking a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. Uh, and you were much more precise. Jose, how many teaspoons? How many tablespoons? How many cups? I mean, how many grams? You were <laughs> perfection. Nobody will say that, yes. Martha Stewart has a reputation for being perfect, for aiming for the best. And I say that with the most respect. But even the so perfect people, the so super perfect Martha Stewart, maybe you had a few disasters here and there in the kitchen. I mean, is oh, oh, who knows? I mean, what was a time that something went wrong for Martha in the kitchen? Well, we have Thanksgiving. In the kitchens of life. Okay, we have... We have Thanksgiving coming up, and I've been thinking turkey, right? And I remember the one major disaster I had in the kitchen, the biggest disaster in the kitchen, was my first Thanksgiving when I had my family and my husband's family. Remember, I was 19 years old when I got married, and I was a student. My husband was at Yale Law School, and we were living in a little cottage on a lake outside of New Haven, 
and I wanted to have everybody for Thanksgiving dinner. So uh, I had made my stuffings. I had bought the huge turkey, a 32-pound turkey, just down the road from our house. It was the Gotzi Turkey Farm. It was a beautiful, fresh-killed turkey. And I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to stuff it because I had read you cannot stuff a turkey before you're going to put it in the oven. It'll You'll get, you'll get all kinds of problems and food poisoning and da-da-da. So I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I had asked my husband to preheat the oven. And it had to be preheated to 320 degrees. I was going to do a slow roast of this turkey because it was so big. And he had put the, turkey, the oven on broil. And I didn't check it. And that was the last time I did not check a temperature in my life because I went back to bed and I woke up to a house full of black smoke. The turkey had broiled. The skin had broiled. Like black, black. and blue? How do you no, call it? No, black. Black. <laughs> and and I, got, I was so <laughs> upset. And I ran. I got in the car, drove you created down. created a new dish. I, yeah, well, Real turkey. I know. With bl- super crispy black, black skin. skin. So I went down. I drove down the road to the Godsey Turkey Farm. They were all packed up to leave for Florida because they had made their money and they were going to Florida. But they had one turkey left in the cooler. And they gave it to me because they laughed about this. In the story. cooler or in the freezer? No, it was no, it was in the cooler. They were ah, going to so put it. You were safe. I was safe. I went, ran back home, and this is like a, only a half a mile down the road. I went back home, took the stuffing out of the burnt turkey, and put it in the f- new turkey, and adjusted the temperature and everything, and went. Then I could go back to bed for a couple hours. So, so Martha, so, you saved Thanksgiving. I did, and then guess what? The turkey that was black was so delicious. We tasted it. We skin, you know, took the black skin off. It was so. So delicious. it's now a new tradition in Martha's Stewart. No, home there is that a recipe. You make no, the black I, skin broiler no, turkey, and a friend of mine has a recipe for blackened turkey, and she's made it on my show. It's a combination of all kinds of spices and Coca Cola and all other kinds of things that makes the skin black. So and, every time we see you, you seem to start everything from scratch. We like. We Come like on, that. But but. Tell me the truth. Come on, you cheat sometimes. You you have to cheat. I really, I Tell me early cheat. But, but if you were going to cheat in something you're not making from scratch, what will what that thing will be that? Well, As so as that you are pre buy that you don't have to make from scratch. Something like you know it's ingredient. We all have those. Like no, you say, the other, Oh my god, this tomato sauce is so good that I cannot make it I'm better. I'm telling you, I just the other day I had this argument with someone. They said they like this kind of tomato sauce. Rayo's is good. Paul Newman's sauce. I have never bought, ever bought a tomato sauce. So you will not buy my potato chips because I already fried them for you? No. Well, no. I, potato chips, you know, if I'm going to serve onion dip, I'll buy the tomato. The okay. So that's kind of but, cheating. But You're the, not making the potatoes from scratch. But the best potato chips are the ones I make, waffle potato chips, cut like waffles. Oh, yeah. With and, the mandolin. And, yes. And I Do cook. you ever cut your finger doing uh, of them? Of course I have. Manicure, I, look, pedicure? I, I have no nails. I, 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 I cut myself a little And time. I cook them in olive oil, in very good olive oil. <laughs> Spanish olive oil, I hope. I think it is. And, and sea salt. Those are the best, best chips there are. Okay, so what you're telling me is that, yes, you like to cook everything from scratch. Rarely, rarely buy something pre-cooked. And I have never ordered in a pizza. I don't order in. I just, I don't like takeout food. I like to eat in restaurants or in the car. I will stop by your fabulous. So during the pandemic, you were like Martha Stewart cooking I home was every the day. cook. I, and because I, I have a farm. I live on a farm. So yeah. we, we have our own eggs. We have our own chickens. We have our own gardens. And I, grow, I have my own citrus now. I have not bought a lemon in a very long time. And I live in New York State. <laughs> so, really. It's so, Martha, true. moving into the next <laughs> topic I wanted to touch. Obviously. But I'm not perfect, everybody. Just know that once on a TV show, wow. my nephew pointed mm-hmm. out that I said perfectly perfect 21 times in one show. M- M- Martha and Stewart I have saying never... she's not perfect is making the rest of us looking like, oh, my God, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to... Uh, perfection saying I'm not perfect as perfect as you Your think. food well, is perfect, Jose. Uh, so uh, you're building this amazing business. You'll be more beyond the book. You 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 create the Martha Stewart, Omnimedia, books, TV shows, magazines. Mm-hmm. You... 
I product, guess product. in the early days, you yes, you 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 are you you are trying to find your voice. Yes, you are already forty little. Your first book, and and everybody is going to scrutinize you. Everybody is going to be looking with a lens. You're a woman, and she's a businesswoman, and she's trying to get into this business. That uh, do you do you feel that at the beginning you had to be more Martha Stewart, more serious because being in business and and being the leader you were becoming, you had to to portray yes, this kind I, of serious I, look. Well, because I lately, I see it's almost like <laughs> a huge change from the Martha of the I, past and I, the Martha of today. Today, have, now you are doing so many different things yes, with I, so many different individuals and people uh, in so many different... It seems you are laughing in every corner well, every I've, single time. I've, I guess you can say that I've loosened up a little bit. And because remember, when you're starting a business, um, they they have to take you seriously. And you have to, um, and you're raising money for an IPO. Uh, it was hard to raise that money originally, and then I finally, I finally re got the right partner, uh, who was not going to take sixty percent of the business. The first, the first partner said, "Oh yeah, we'll 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 invest sixty forty," and I said, "Well, it's sixty for me and forty for you." And he said, "Oh no no no, the other way around, Martha. You're just a beginner," and I walked out. I walked out of that negotiation. I didn't want to. I didn't want to hear such a, such numbers, and but that came from my parents. Knowing your self worth is terribly important when you're starting in business. Knowing that you have a good idea is very important when you're starting a business, and so I got to. I got to have a good self confidence from my parents, and they would say, you know, you can do anything, Martha. You have to work hard. You're smart. You're good. You can do it. And uh, that kind of self-confidence engendered by my parents, basically, was, was a, a good foundation. Hmm. So just for us to understand how loosen up you're becoming, uh, <laughs> I've been hearing lately that you're having crushes. Crushes? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I heard that I had a, a crush on Snoop Dogg. I read it as a front-page story in some one of those national, uh, not Inquirer, national something or other. Uh, and it, it's just funny. I just laugh about stuff like that. As my mother rolls over in her grave, um, I just laugh because it is, it's kind of amusing. Press is press. Publicity is publicity. And, um, and yet what it does um, is just engender kind of a, a, a nice, a nice uh, easiness. And it also, um, it also shows you that your demographic can grow if you are, are a little bit more uh, understanding of all the different kinds of people that you appeal to. But uh, the collaboration you and Snob Dog uh, are doing is amazing. Yeah, you it's seem been, to have it's such been an great. amazing chemistry. Well, he's an incredible, easygoing guy. Creative like you. Very creative. And uh, and we work on several big projects together, Bic Lighters, Skechers Shoes. Um, we've worked on it. We've had a show, um, three seasons of a fantastic show called Potluck Dinner. And uh, and you know the pot is there, it's smoking away, and uh, and I I only I only breathe the smoke, and he does the smoking. Uh, it's a very uh, it's an easygoing relationship, but it look you saw you saw the gastro ghetto guys just Amazing. this morning. They uh, love me because I go with the flow, and and I think you learn that as you get older, going with the flow. Well. Martha, it was a great honor to have you here in Longer Tables. I know there is hundreds of thousands of podcasts, but I am so lucky. We are so lucky that you decided to spend here a little bit of time drinking with us. really good wine and becoming very loose tongued. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Really, you are amazing. My sister, until next time, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>